Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. You know, this, our guest today is a, an exceptional case, but he's not completely atypical. So many fantastic uh, Boilermaker success stories. I get the privilege these days of meeting a lot of people who came here and um, through their own hard work and the excellence of this place launched their careers. And Sam Allen, I think, would count himself one of those. He grew up in a military family and spent a lot of time, as I did as a kid, in the South and then came to Kokomo, Indiana and uh, on to Purdue, graduating in industrial management and began a career at John Deere that took him straight to the top. Um, along the way, he um, maintained contact here at Purdue and then in life with Marsha, his high school sweetheart. And so theirs is a great story on the personal side too. But uh, the John Deere company, known to us all uh, so squarely in the, in the heritage of what we are as a school, when you think of our original land grant assignment, agriculture and the mechanical arts. And they come together in a, uh, uh, with complete excellence in the, in the great company the world knows as John Deere. We're just incredibly proud that one of our grads uh, has risen to leadership there. He's been a citizen in every respect. He's also just winding up several years as leader of the Council on Competitiveness, which is perhaps the best organization of business and and uh, academic uh, leaders working on those problems that get in the way of America's being as uh, successful economically and as competitive in the world as we want to be. So he serves in multiple capacities, and, uh, but he's been gracious enough to come back and spend a day with us here at Purdue. And Sam Allen, thank you for all you've done, all the, all the reflected uh, uh, luster you brought to our university. And, we appreciate having you here today and looking forward to your comments and the questions I hope you'll prepare yourselves with um, for, the, for the bulk of our hour. Welcome. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, and it is a, a pleasure to be back. Uh, Marcia, who's with me, my wife, and I don't get to get back very often, so it, it you know, there's a double objective here. One is the opportunity to participate in something like this, but the second objective is also just to get back on campus, which is a good thing for us. As uh, President Daniels indicated, I've um, started my career at John Deere right out of here. I graduated from here in May of 75, and on 2 June, I started working for the company. So I've got 39 years, uh, good years with the company so far and uh, had the good benefit to uh, be in all the divisions of the company, which uh, I think has definitely been a, a positive in, in this role that I now get to be the chairman and CEO of the company. Interestingly enough, the company is 177 years old, so I think 32 years older mm -hmm. than Purdue University, and I think President Daniels is the 12th president and I'm only the ninth chairman and CEO in that 177-year <laughs> history, so uh, it is a company that has a lot of history to it. Uh, for those of you that might not know John Deere, uh, there really was a gentleman by the name of John Deere. Uh, he developed the self-scouring plow and started this company. Uh, today, we're about a $36 billion company, about 64,000 employees. Our uh, largest business, which is what we're probably best known for, is agricultural equipment. Uh, we're number one in the world in ag equipment, but we also have a fairly large construction equipment division. We're number two in U.S. and Canada behind uh, Caterpillar. Our third largest business would be our forestry business, and we're number one in the world in forestry with over half of the market. And then we also are a manufacturer of turf equipment, uh, premium turf equipment, both for golf and for home and maintenance. And then the uh, fifth leg of our businesses is where we've got John Deere Financial, which is a credit company with a $40 billion loan portfolio that does business in, in roughly 40 of the 140 countries that we operate in. 
and we have about 27 countries that we manufacture or have operations in. So that's a, a little bit about the company. What I thought I would further add is the theme that was talked about. In uh, 2010, we set about uh, refocusing the company based on some of the macroeconomic trends going on, which uh, in particular was about population growth and dietary changes. And at the time when we started, there was about uh, 7 billion people. There's probably 7.2 billion on the earth today. By 2050, it will be 9.4, 9.6 billion. By the end of the century, probably 10 billion. And that 30% population growth, plus the dietary changes associated with the world economically prospering and being able to eat better, specifically going as they go from a dollar, two dollars a day to five to eight dollars a day, going from just eating cereal grains to eating uh, protein in the form of chicken, beef, whatever it may be, that's going to require, as a result, a doubling of food output. So the population growth adds to it, but it's the fact that a lot of people don't appreciate, but it takes four to seven times the calorie input of grain to get one calorie output of protein between chicken and beef. And that's what's going to cause the doubling. We've seen that this last decade in particular uh, in China, where over the year, over the decade, with 300 people, million people moving into the middle class, China is the number one consumer of pork in the world. And that's what's really driven some of the need for grain production. And as a result of that, looking at that, we feel uh, strongly that uh, both construction equipment, but in particular ag equipment and what we call ag equipment solutions, is a tremendous opportunity for John Deere because there's only about 17% more arable land in the world and we've got a double food output. And that means that while we will bring additional land into production, most of this has to come from ramping up the amount of, uh, of yield growth on each existing acre, and that takes precision agriculture and high production agriculture, and we believe no one's better uh, uh, prepared to enable that with the farmers than John Deere. And so we've put a lot of focus, a lot of R&D in it, and I'm proud to say that uh, we had a good year in 2010, but 2011 then was all-time record best year in the history of the company. 2012 exceeded that, 2013 exceeded that, and 2014 will be the second best year slightly behind 2013. So it's a, a really great opportunity to be a part of John Deere right now, and we feel we have a, a strong, strong uh, opportunity to uh, help the world uh, by serving those that are linked to the land, those that enable human flourishing, which are the farmers of the world. And that's what we're really focused on. So it's good to be here, and I look forward to our discussion. Well, it's as noble a mission as, uh, as any uh, uh, community, and that's what a company is, could take on. And, and uh, obviously, it's very close to uh, one that Purdue will always remain uh, active in. And uh, we appreciate the chance for partnerships uh, with your company. So uh, I'll ask the first two or three questions while you uh, summon the courage to come, some of you, to come uh, to um, the mics, which are somewhere there. Um, and I'm tempted to start with golf. I, I left out of the uh, introduction that that young man from Kokomo uh, played his way onto the Purdue campus. He was an Evans scholar. May, many of you will know some of those. These are young men and women who uh, caddy and are uh, win, win, earn scholarships to, to go to schools of their choice and, um, and then played for the Purdue golf team. So. Um, those of you who want tips, he'll be available in the lobby after. <laughs> but I would not be a good one to get tips. <laughs> but uh, uh, let, me, uh, let me start where, where I, you were, had just taken us um, and ask you, uh, when you think about the goal, feeding 9 to 10 billion people, what are the uh, biggest barriers? Are they technological? Uh, is it, are, are they the limits to arable land? Is it regulatory and government policies that could impede? It's probably these in some mix, but when Deere thinks about them, what, what are the hurdles, most important hurdles that need to, or problems that need to be worked out? You know, in 2009, we were a, a part of a group that started what's called the Global Harvest Initiative, and that was between NGOs, uh, parts of the government, as well as private enterprise, really saying we need to bring focus back to agricultural research, because we'd really had let that slip. 
And while we've continued to, to see yield increases year over year, the rate of increase has slowed down from a, a number of years ago, and, and it's going to have to increase again to, to feed the world. There is quite a bit more arable land. There, we would estimate roughly there's 17 percent more arable land in the world that could come into production. That wouldn't be enough, though, to double output, so you still have to definitely increase uh, yields. Likewise, um, you have to be able to do it in a sustainable fashion. And probably near term, one of the biggest impediments is water. Mm -hmm. There's uh, approximately 67% of the world's fresh water is used by agriculture. Uh, it's not feasible to say, well, let's not just uh, irrigate crops. Um, it's about 17, 18% of the cropland that's irrigated. It produces over 40% of the crop output. So water is an, a critical enabler of increasing yields, though it has to be done more and more efficiently. And I would say in the near term, water is going to be one of the biggest challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, it already is in some of the places in the US, but you know, China is very, very close to being out of water, especially water that's not contaminated. Mm -hmm. And so in the case of China and India, it's not only that they have very little groundwater left, uh, it's that uh, you know, they talk about it now being dirty water. Mm -hmm. And it's not water that you would even want to put on a crop. India, most people don't appreciate it, but at the rate of consumption, uh, that they, it's forecasted that within 15 years they could be out of water, mm -hmm. other than the monsoons and all that, but clearly wouldn't have an additional water. China has some of the same issue. Uh, I think everybody's read about some of the big canals that they're bringing in from the south, trying to bring them up to the Beijing area in order to enable uh, additional water for both irrigation and for commercial development. But that probably is, in, at least in my opinion, would be the, the near-term biggest challenge. Mm -hmm. um, the second part is bringing to parts of the world really rich information on agronomic decision making. So many of the places where we operate, uh, you'll see that um, people do not really understand uh, agronomics. Uh, and another, India again is a prime example of this, where the government used to pay uh, farmers a uh, subsidized fee for fertilizer to put on the crops, but they never told them best way to use it. And so what happens is they've over-fertilized the land to the point that it's not productive anymore. Mm -hmm. And they're having to move back off of that. So um, near term, for me, in my mind, it would be uh, definitely water. Um, some people believe it's going to be hard to get the yield improvements that we're talking about. Personally, I, I don't think that's the case. I'm very much of an optimist in that area. I think we'll see continued growth in yields both from genetics, but in particular, as agriculture is moving more and more to uh, data-driven agriculture with all the information coming on off the, the, the farm field, the opportunity to use that information to make better agronomic decisions and grow the yields, I think without a doubt, uh, will allow us to meet the near-term challenges there. Um, so uh, over the long term, I think we'll get there, but I think we're going to have some hiccups along the way, in particular with things like water. Yeah. No, I mean, and it, it isn't the importance of water and the possible shortage isn't even limited to the, uh, our need to feed the world. A lot of conflicts over history have been fought over water, and there are people who believe there could, uh, a next great conflict somewhere could start out of the desperation of somebody who's running out. Yeah. So, yeah. Especially, uh, you know, I even hear it, it could be in, the, in this country between Colorado and California. You know, there, you're mm -hmm. seeing a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, concern in both areas mm -hmm. and a lot of question as to who really has the rights to right. the water and what should the decisions uh, be made. But in particular, you know, I think in all of those, the challenge, and it's not easy to get around this, but the, the, the places that are efficient with water are places where water has a, a price. Yeah. And as long as one allows somebody to extract it from the ground for free, right. you're not incented to practice really good to, water to management. Conserve it, right. Um, obviously, ours is a university which is deeply involved in, in research and new 
trying to develop new technologies in the areas you just talked about. Plant genetics is a great example currently that uh, uh, tantalize us a little bit. What, what, what new technologies might we uh, see from John Deere or from uh, related industries and companies in the year, years ahead that are going to get us to this? I know uh, Dean Ackridge keeps telling me it won't be long before we see a driverless tractor. I and mean, what else you guys got in the skunk yeah. works? Well, we've had driverless <laughs> tractors now for quite some yeah. time. And uh, the biggest challenge with a driverless tractor is uh, not being able to have it go down the field, uh, but it's being able to detect, is that a stone, a rabbit, uh -huh. or a small person? Uh -huh. And that, that really, uh, at this point in time, is the, is the biggest you issue. Get that worked out before you turn them loose. That'd, yeah. that'd, that'd, that'd yeah. be good. Yeah. yeah, we'll be sued otherwise, <laughs> yeah. which is part of the issue. But um, we'll probably first see things like that, actually, in more controlled environments mm -hmm. like vineyards, for example, mm -hmm. where they can run at night and all that. But we, I'd, t I'd take us down a couple different paths. Um, certainly, we're still going to have uh, equipment getting smarter and smarter. Uh, all our equipment today goes out with a telematic solution. So, for example, the head of tractor engineering can sit in his office and he can uh, ping a tractor operating in Germany <laughs> and see, you know, is, is what's the uh, hours on the tractor, is the engine running properly, a uh, number of different things like that. So that there's data like that that's being enabled. We're, we're quickly optimizing the machine itself, so it's self-adjusting, et cetera. The, the area that we're working on big time now is really making what the, the tractor, for example, pulls smart and it's really taken over the tractor so that uh, you know for example on a planter uh, that you will be able to plant individually each row but then you will also the planter will be able to tell the tractor to speed up or slow down mm -hmm. based upon its ability to uh, lay that perfect uh, seed in the ground because number one impact on yield is being able to get the right spacing and right depth on, on that mm -hmm. uh, for example corn seed that, that's certainly uh, coming in there. We uh, already are working on systems where um, the uh, combines going down the field harvesting, and you've got tractors with grain wagons, and today the, the uh, combine will send out a signal, and the tractor operator will let go of the steering wheel, and the combine takes over and brings the tractor with the grain cart right up next to the the combine as it's still going through the field mm -hmm. and then the unloading auger unloads it and then once it's full the moment the tractor operator brings uh, turns the string wheel they break the connection and they take it off the next step you can vision of that very quickly is you've got uh, six combines and 12 tractors and grain carts in the uh, field and as the combines going down all six of them going down the field you're measuring how quickly the the grain bin is filling up, and based on that real time, you're, you're optimizing which tractor grain cart goes to which combine so they never have to mm. stop to get the yield up. Those are the type of things that you can do on, on the, what I'll call the mechanical side of the system. But probably without a doubt, the biggest area of opportunity for us is in what we call John Deere Farm Site, which is our ability to take all this information that we're collecting, whether it be from the planter, whether it be from the combine, um, combined with the information we get on soil chemistry, everything else, we take it up into the cloud, uh, what we, myjohndeer.com, our cloud, and allow then farmers working with their agronomists to look at that to further optimize the following year, okay, what is it we want to do different to increase the yield? Mm -hmm. And then we'll take that information back and we'll, um, we'll then uh, uh, set a prescription that will then go ahead and in, we're getting to the point that we're doing it by individual row. <laughs> Same thing with the sprayers and everything. And a, an example of this that just shows the power, earlier this year I was in uh, Australia. Australia has very little water and it's a big issue. And this is a large farmer using our equipment and using our uh, soil moisture probe and they had, through two years of data, had discovered that, okay, if we get past this level of ground moisture, no amount of rain is going to help us anymore. 
and we want to go from now putting fertilizers on to con conserving costs, because no matter how much fertilizer we mm. put on, the yield's not going to go up. And so it, you, you normally think of, of this big data and bringing it in to increase yield. In their case, it was not about increasing yield, it was also reducing costs, mm -hmm. so they kept margins up. That's what's happening, and it's going to happen more and more. Spectacular. So I'll, give, I'll ask one more, and that I hope will, while it's being answered, somebody will step forward and, and ask better questions than I am. Um, talk to us. We will have some business students here uh, as well, following in uh, your direct footsteps. Talk to us about the, the, uh, uh, the nature and the origins and the power of the John Deere brand. When people measure these across all categories of business, John Deere is always up there in the in the top rank, uh, recognized universally in this country and over most of the world now, and it's a big advantage, and you've got to be, in keeping you number one. Uh, it's, a, it's, a lot, it's about a lot more than a cool color and, a, and, a, and somebody's catchy slogans. Uh, you have to build that over time and maintain it. What, how do you guys think about the brand, and what do you do to keep it so strong? Well, certainly, um what we talk about, our, our opportunity through the future is to continue to extend, and extend the brand globally. Um, in places like here, the brand is very, very deep. Yeah. A lot of that um, really comes from uh, people that ran the company years and years ago. I'll, I'll never forget, I was in Arkansas visiting a dealer and he talked about his uh, great-grandfather who, during the D Depression, was a John Deere dealer. And John Deere went ahead and, and said, you don't have to pay until you get the mm -hmm. money back. And the guy broke down in tears as yeah. he's talking about that. And you know, there were times like that in our history that have uh, really created uh, impressions, deep impressions, and deep loyalties. Don't you still have a forbearance fund that you set up that enables today's dealers to uh, try to help folks who are in a tough Well, patch? What, we, what we do is through our gender financial, our credit yeah. company, um, you know, one of the things that we're always looking at, the, the finance company is there to enable the sale of equipment and to right. support the dealer. So we, what we will do is we'll work with the dealer to keep them solvent mm -hmm. way more than any normal financial yeah. entity would. But um, that reputation over a long period of time, people will come up to me and talk about you know, their, their Johnny Popper tractor or something of that mm -hmm. nature. That, that certainly has created part of the brand loyalty inside the U.S. I think a uh, equally important part has been, you know, the values of the company. Uh, we've always been a company that's been very, very high on integrity, and I think mm -hmm. that that further supports it. And then, um, as we move around the world, uh, you know, we work hard to uh, develop that same reputation. What we found that's easier is when we're going around the world, whether it be uh, Russia, whether it be China, or South America, it, the large equipment, big tractors, big combines, John Deere is pretty well known by any farmer, and the loyalty is there. Mm -hmm. But as we've gone into places like India, where the average tractor is a 36 horsepower tractor, and, um, and, and that's all, you know, we've had to work hard on building our brand there. But without a doubt, uh, Every employee understands that, you know, the brand, if we ever did something that, where we failed to live up to our value proposition, yeah. that the, the cost would be astronomical to us and our brand. Yeah. It takes decades maybe to build a great reputation. You can lose it pretty fast if you don't. Yeah. I think we've seen yeah. that a few times. Well, when you made it in, into the title of a country song a few years ago, I knew you'd really arrived, you know, when, when Billy Bob painted Carlene's name on the water tower and John Deere Green, I figured somebody should get a raise for that. So. You know, people have asked us, uh, you know, do you pay somebody for those songs? I said, no, most of the time we don't even know they're really? doing it. And the same thing, some of the actors like some, or musicians like Kid Rock, you know, yeah. wearing John Deere caps. Yeah. I'm not sure I really wanted him to wear a John Deere <laughs> cap, but, but we're, no, we don't pay anybody. They just do that on yeah. their own. 
So let's uh, let's uh, we got we'll start on, over on our left, please. Hello, uh, my name is Chris Molina, and I'm a senior out of Cranert. Um, I'm majoring in management, and I actually finished up th my third internship this past summer with John Deere doing supply management, and I was fortunate enough to accept an offer for full time starting next summer. So I'm Whoa. very excited about hey. that. Um, so granted that I know a, a little bit about John Deere, um, and having a goal. Um, targeted at 2015 and having it be such a big goal. Can you talk a little bit about the John Deere Foundation and how that's helping John Deere attain that goal? Because I don't think many people know about the John Deere Foundation. Yeah, sure. So our foundation, like every company, normally establishes a foundation to, mm -hmm. to provide money uh, to help the whatever they believe are their causes. In our case, uh, we're up to about $20 million a year that we give, and uh, the big uh, focus we have is we, we really divide it in a couple of different areas. One is on uh, focus on world hun hunger, and in particular, partnering with um, small track family farmers and working to help them increase their yield. Um, and we've got great examples in sub Saharan Africa and India where working with them, you take a farmer that may make $800 a year, and by working with them on this, you can get up to Two, three, four thousand dollars a year—it's huge change for them. Mm. Um, so that's one big focus. Then the, the second big focus is really uh, supporting the communities in which we operate, because we we do believe strongly that uh, you're in the communities and you need to be able to give back as yep. as well. So those would be two of the real big areas in the foundation. And then the part that we add to that is that we really encourage volunteerism. And so what we then try to do, in fact, we pay, uh, we give paid time off and we provide through the foundation if you work for a, a charity um, for 40 hours above and beyond what you were, we'll give $1,000 to that mm -hmm. charity for every 40 hours. And what that does for us is it also then creates employee development because we believe volunteerism is one of the ways you can further develop employees. Yeah. And so that's, uh, that's a little bit of the foundation work. Great. Hello, my name is Ryan Musselman. I'm a grad student in agriculture economics, and I had an internship this summer as well and accepted a full-time offer, so I'm... There's a trend here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm interested on the more personal side as far as um, working for the, the company and um, just business in general. What is something that separated yourself or where you became distinguishable, distinguishable against your uh, peers to uh, be successful in the position that you're in? It's always risky when you talk about yourself. Um, you know, it, what I would say is, uh, through my career, I was fortunate to be given a lot of opportunities, and I looked at them as opportunities as opposed to um, as risks. So when I first started with the company, people said, you know, you, you don't want to get out of the ag division, for example, because the ag division was the biggest piece of the company. Well, I was in the turf division for a while. I was been in the construction forestry division a couple different times. Um, you know, so uh, it, when you, so part of it was being willing to take on these opportunities, which as a result of that, I think it caused me to, I didn't think, I know it did, it caused me to broaden myself a lot more and think uh, a lot broader and be much more adaptable uh, as we move progress forward. The second thing is uh, demonstrating the ability to achieve results, both how you achieve them, but then you, you, you've got to achieve them. And uh, probably two thirds of the way through my career, there, there were a couple times where I've given very, very um, important assignments. Uh, for example, building a new engine factory in Mexico where um, a lot of people thought it was the risk of doing that was much higher than any potential reward, but we were able to bring it in and on time and on cost, and it's still one of you know, our best facilities now. And when, when you do those things and you bring the people together, you get recognized for that, and as a result of that, then you get another opportunity. Um, but you gotta take the opportunity. So many times I see people that, um, they, when they look at the opportunity, they're looking at the risk associated with the opportunity. And so a lot of times, really good people that could move a long way 
limit themselves because they're not willing to, uh, to go ahead and, and uh, jump in the deep end of the pool, so to speak, and take on that risk. Uh, that was, uh, those were probably really important, plus a very supportive wife that uh, allowed us to move a lot of times when mm -hmm. it wasn't easy to move with young kids and everything. Those were the things that uh, end up uh, being real important. And in Deer, it's, um, every company has their own culture. In Deer's culture, it's not about your position. You've got to be able to work with people in a collegial fashion. And if you're not able to, to generate results without having people work directly for you, I, I think you end up having a, a harder time m moving ahead. So um, clearly, getting the results, but it's also how you get the results and then uh, not turning down opportunities. All right. Uh, so I'm going to break, the, break, I'm going to break the cycle. Um, I actually spent the summer interning mm -hmm. at NASA. My name is Ativ Gupta. Uh, we did a design, design build fly of a UAV to um, just gather agricultural data over a large, uh, a couple acres of crops. Is John Deere looking into that, into UAV research? You, you uh, I think you'd be really disappointed if I just didn't say yes. Uh, we've, had, uh, we've had our own little uh, aircraft. People have given different examples of, of aircraft going around fields. We don't intend, at least at this point in time, to get into the, the business of, we, we would partner with people in terms of getting into whatever type of, uh, whether it be small helicopters, balloons, whatever it may be, small airplanes to, to do some of the visuals for the field. What we really want to do is we want to be the, the uh, through myjohndeer.com, we want to be the place where all that information then resides that farmers and agronomists and everybody can work on that to then decide, okay, what do we, what do, we do different as a result of having this information? Uh, it's certainly, um, you know, it, agriculture right now is moving through a, a lot of growth again. I think that's been enabled by the fact that we've had $7 corn for a while. And when there's a lot of money being made, that's when it drives a pull for innovation. And so we, whether it be in that area, whether it be in compaction and all the uh, issues with compaction, whether it be with the seed companies, you've just got a lot of things coming. And it, it's not a question of whether they all will help. It's, they all will, it's just a question of which ones will be the major drivers of, of yield growth versus the minor. Hello, my name is Ryan Murphy. I'm a graduate student in food science here at Purdue. Uh, my question is related to the countries in Sub-Saharan Africa that have yet to reach their agricultural potential, you could say. Uh, how do you think these countries will, can best progress towards this potential in terms of what needs to be prioritized regarding government reforms, uh, technological advancement, producer education, et cetera? Mm -hmm. And how do you think John Deere can help uh, reach this? So the number one impediment in any of these areas, well, the number one and number two, and it can be debated on which, whether you're talking sub-Saharan Africa, whether you're talking Russia, some of the CIS, uh, one of them is always the political system and the leadership, and the second one is infrastructure. And you know, it's one thing to grow it, but normally you're not growing it next to a port or uh, next to where it's consumed. So you, you need to either you know, roads, rail, canals, whatever. You need to have a way to get it uh, to the port. Um, in all cases, both of those aren't existing right now. Normally, good infrastructure is uh, driven by good leadership, governmental leadership. So I'd probably put them in the order of good leadership first. And uh, in the meantime, it gets to be a little hard. We, what we do do is we, we try to go into some of the areas in countries where we feel we can operate in. So uh, Kenya, for example, or Tanzania. I was, last year I was in Tanzania uh, and so, uh, South Africa, for example. And you, know, you have opportunities there with both small farmers and big farmers to help bring them along much more quickly. But they become pockets. 
It's not, you can't do it countrywide, but at least you can get it in areas. I think that's probably what you'll see happen in some of those markets is you'll, you can work on bringing up the mass, but to really move agriculture, what will happen is you'll end up with uh, an area that, uh, because of local leadership, that the area, uh, the farmers in that area have really progressed significantly and the country doesn't prevent that from happening. And then you can, again, add on to from that. Um, when we were in Tanzania, we were with a, a farmer that, uh, in the middle of nowhere, uh, and, and uh, he had uh, 1,200 hectares of land and was growing about seven different crops and sending tulip bulbs up to Holland and all kinds of other things and had gotten pretty sophisticated. That can happen and, it, you know, the good news about Agriculture, it's not done in the big cities, and most of the corruption is in the big cities. <laughs> so it, those type of things can happen from that standpoint. But I, you know, it's not going to be a steady path, in my opinion. It's going to be one step forward, a half a step back, two steps forward, a step back. It's, it's, it's going to be slow because of all these other impediments. And, you know, what we watch for is when do we think a country is starting to change from a leadership standpoint where they're getting more progressive because the moment that happens, uh, agriculture, just like here, a long time ago, agriculture is going to be one of the first things that develops fully. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Ryan. Over here. Hello. Hi. Hi. My name is Jesse Peters. I'm currently a student at Ivy Tech trying to work my way back into Purdue. I'd like to study uh, agronomy, become an agronomist. And one of my reasons is the reason you're here today you know, I see our, our cities expanding and our farmland getting smaller, and I look at my, I have three young boys and think, you know, I'd like to see, make sure they go to bed full every night and that their children and grandchildren go to bed full every night. Um, we, we operate a small farm on the south side of Lafayette, and we have a 1954 John Deere 40, mm -hmm. a 55, uh, 70, and a 1959 630, great machines. Um, but anyway, how can the small farmer and small farm become involved maybe with John Deere in this research and, and become involved in assisting with the uh, increase of crop yields in the future? Yeah, that's, uh, it, it's always a challenge, um, specifically in the U.S. You know, I, as I mentioned, uh, in some of these uh, developing areas of the world, we do it more from a foundation standpoint, more from the idea of help, helping people that uh, are subsistence farmers move up a little bit from that standpoint. Here, I, you know, there's uh, the ag extension offices and things like that that can help, but, um, you know, it, uh, I really don't have a great answer for you on that. Um, certainly our dealers, uh, end up being a, a uh, contact point around. They uh, obviously also focus a lot on the large farmers as opposed to the small farmers, but a lot of them are built, bringing in uh, agronomists into their uh, organizations to help with the uh, different farmers, et cetera. Um, the, uh, I think the challenge for the small farmer that you were just alluding to is if, if the f small farmer a lot of times has older equipment, and the older equipment is not the equipment that, from a technology standpoint, has been information uh, enabled through telematics. Uh, and a lot of what we're talking about in the future is going to require those telematic type solutions to port the information back up. But that's, uh, you know, it, when we have um, $5, $7 corn, Small farmers can still make it. You know, if we go through an extended period, like we are right now, of three and a half dollar corn, that makes it much more difficult because scale is a is certainly a driver of this business. Thank you, Jesse. We're looking forward to seeing you back here at Purdue. Hello, my name is Corey Harris. I am a senior in agricultural economics and political science. Um, you spoke a little bit earlier about the very cool things that you guys are doing with a lot of the big data that you're that you're getting from farmers. Uh, but I also know there's a lot of contention in the industry about the ownership of that data and the privacy 
and how farmers can protect their privacy with that data. Can you speak a little bit about your view on that? Yeah, we're very proud of how we went into this and uh, early on, we were one of, in fact, may have been even the first, but we said early on that the data is the farmer's data. It's not the agronomist's data, it's not the seed company's data. Everything coming off that machine is, belongs to the farmer. We also said even for our cells to use it, we have to get the farmer to sign off and to allow us to use it. Now, what we try to do is aggregate the data up uh, we're not wanting to look at specific farmers, but we want to be able to look at a lot of different farmers to see, okay, how do we make that tractor better? How do we make that combine better? What, what are we seeing in terms of uh, uh, stresses and strains on it? Um, but then we go out and, and it resides in the, the cloud, myjohndeer.com, and that farmer will, will allow that farmer to hook up whoever they want, but they have to give permission. And that's where we've been a little different. Some tried to come into the market and say the data was, was theirs and they, they didn't want to give it back to the farmer. Um, but we have from day one said, no, it's the farmer's data and we're gonna ask their permission if we can use it. And then if they don't give us the permission, we won't use it. Um, and we think because of our brand, because of our reputation, that uh, from that standpoint, we would argue they can trust us uh, because we've, you know, we, we have uh, over 177 years have maintained that commitment to integrity, and when we say we're not going to do something, we don't do it. Great, thank you. Okay, um, my name is Adam Farmer. Actually, quite funny for an event like this. I actually have a kind of last name. <laughs> Anyways, I'm a freshman here, so I feel kind of out of place because I don't think there are many of us here. And actually, I'd like to digress back to the point of like the water and like the actual food because I'm actually like a health and human sciences major, and that's what brought my interest here is like the health and human sciences part, like the food and like the quality. Mm -hmm. And I'm really curious. I have about three questions. You must okay. be my answer. Mm -hmm. I'll ask one at a time. Okay. I'm Anyways, a the, I'm ahead of the whole freshman class. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But like the first question I'd like to ask is, I remember you talking. I'd like to digress back to the food and water. Because I remember you talking about like the water like running low, and I'm curious, what would what are you gonna, what do you plan on doing that? Like, do you have any idea of what you're going to do about that? Like, I'm curious about this. Yeah. So, what what is I, I should have probably mentioned it. I didn't. Even though agriculture uses 67 percent of the world's fresh water, um, that's not a commensurate amount would not be used, for example, in the U.S. What what really drives that water uses are places like in India where they just flood irrigate, they don't level the land and all of that. Um, but what we're gonna end up having to do is you have to get more and more efficient, which ends up being, um, whether it be mechanical pivot irrigation systems, uh, whether we were actually for a while in the drip irrigation, drip tape business, which is about as efficient as it gets, but we couldn't find a way to really make that work for row crop. But it's gonna be a combination of that. Uh, the, the best example I can give you, um, this is, uh, I think it was 09 when I was there. It was either 09 or 010. I was in Israel and they've had a, in, in a decade and a half, they've had a seven fold increase in crop output and they've cut water consumption by 50%. And now most of what they grow are more fruits, vegetables, things like that, and that's why drip irrigation works for them. But what happened there is that the, the Israeli farmer owns the land, the government owns the water underneath the land. And so they, they mandated it and raised the price, so they may, and then they provided subsidies to move to drip irrigation in a lot of these uh, places. And as a result, they cut the, the water usage tremendously. So I, you know, there will be places where they'll do that. The other thing you'll see, or uh, I was earlier, a year ago I was in West Texas, which also has huge water issues. They end up changing crop rotations based on what crops consume less water. And uh, until they, they know they've got more water uh, back in, in the pond or whatever. So I, you're gonna see, I, I'll, you'll see a lot of that. It'll go back to, 
what we just mentioned about agriculture in gen general, monetizing either the cost or the opportunity for water is what will drive the innovation that allows you know, water usage to uh, fully meet the needs and, and not uh, end up being, um, not have us run out of it at any point in time. Okay. So do you think this trend will continue like throughout the rest of the world or do you think they're just gonna stay isolated? As far as consumption of water? Or? As far as like the efficiency of the practice and like new technology. Uh, no, it, it, will, um, it, it will have to uh, move in other places of the world unless they have a lot of water uh, because um, the alternative is not a very good alternative. <laughs> I think you'll, you know, for example, uh, China, you know, like them or not, what they do when they have a problem, it's student body right or student body left. So China will edict it in a, one moment of time and boom, some things will change. There will be other places where um, they'll probably go through some hardship before they get there. But without a doubt, globally, um, water consumption um, and desalinating, for example, uh, salt water, things like that will come more and more to the forefront in order to enable uh, continued irrigation. Okay, my next question is actually about the food. And last year, or was it this year, I'm not quite sure now, but there was actually a study that came out showing like the trends of eating. And it turns out like people are eating less red meat now and less beef. Mm -hmm. And like, what, what does this mean? Like, does it mean like the cattle, like some may think the cattle like load may decrease. And what does this mean for like the practice and like the efficiency of it? Like, do you think this will mean less grain yield and less cost if people switch more to poultry instead of beef? Certainly uh, of, the, of the ones poultry, would be the lowest on grain consumption. Uh, hogs would be second, and then the most in terms of consumption would be cattle. There are, without a doubt, we're seeing uh, less beef consumed in the U.S., but there are a lot of countries in the world where, you know, for the first time they're, they're moving away from just eating cereals to being able to eat, uh, whether it be pork, beef, whatever, and so that, that's still gonna spur a lot of that on. Um, so we, and you know, right now, part of the challenge is the herd sizes had gotten down so low, price of beef have gotten so high, and it takes a couple years, two and a half years to get a, a herd size back up. So the U.S. will come back up some. Uh, I don't know, you know, I think a lot of us believe that the meat consumption still is going to go down for health reasons in the U.S., but, it, you know, you take places like uh, Russia, you take places like South America, um, you know, the average consumption of beef per person is significantly below what it is in the developed markets of the world, and, and that will drive some of this for sure. Okay. Adam, Adam, thanks. We've got three questions and probably just about enough time for those, so let's start over here. I have a two-bar question, too, <laughs> but I can make it quick. Um, both of my questions pertain to diversity. Um, one, you talked about, you just touched on s sustainability, um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about um, if the company considers biodiversity um, uh, for a more sustainable ag, or if it's something you talk about, and if you do, how do you consider it? Yeah, I thought diversity was going to go through diversity of, of the people we hire. But that's, <laughs> that's my second question, okay. is women in yeah. ag. Okay. So on a biodiversity standpoint, you know, what we, we do think about it, but in the end, what we really focus on is what is it that the customer wants? And you know, for us, the customer is the, the producer, the farmer, and, and now a lot of them are thinking about it even more. Uh, we do also look at things like through this Global Harvest Initiative, we've, we partner with some NGOs that you might not think that, uh, but they also realize sustainable agriculture, we're gonna need it. You know, one of the best ways to meet this is right now about a third of the food goes to waste and eliminating that uh, food going to waste is a, an easy way to really increase the amount of available food for uh, the human population. So we are involved in some of those things as well to work on it. This is not just about how do we, how do we increase yields on uh, existing farms. But uh, it, that we definitely do spend some time on that. Uh, we have some people in our group that actually are trying to 
do research as to where we think it might go, and as a result of that, how it might impact our business. Okay. And then the second part, um, certainly uh, diversity is a challenge for all of us. Um, you know, we, we are very much focused on it, not just women in agriculture, but women in all parts of our business, as well as uh, people of color and all other nationalities. Um, it was interesting, I was at our bank in Luxembourg last week, and in that bank, we have 200 people, and we had 18 countries represented in that bank. And it was, uh, you know, that, that's kind of what you really like to see, is mm -hmm. that level of uh, inclusion. Because uh, I, I remember mentioning this to Mitch uh, uh, last time we were together. I think one of the reasons the U.S. is going to stay competitive globally is because I think um, in the U.S. there is the opportunity. It's not a given, but there's an opportunity have a much more inclusive culture that allows teams of individuals coming from all parts of the world to work more effectively together. And I have not seen that, in, and I've had a chance to be in all, all around the world. I haven't seen that, for example, in a Japanese company operate as well. I haven't seen that, for example, operate in a uh, uh, South Korean or a Chinese company. But you can bring people from all those areas into a, a multinational U.S.-based company, and people feel, can feel all of their inputs are being considered, and you can build a much higher aligned, engaged team that way, and that's what we're trying to do. Do you find that you struggle to, um, I guess, incorporate women in your workforce because they're less interested in ag? Um, an issue? Uh, you know, um, ag slash engineering, uh, certainly one of the things, and, and we actually are working on that, is how do we get more uh, uh, girls interested? So we were talking earlier today that we partnered with some of the high schools and provided four hours of science engineering training, or here's what engineering is all about to high school girls, and you know, two-thirds of them all of a sudden were more interested in engineering. <laughs> now you gotta sustain it, but, but you can bring it along. So there's also, part of growing our workforce is also increasing the, the base from which we can attract from, and, and certainly uh, that's another thing that we continue to be focused on. Next to the last question over here. I, my name is Andy Dardini, and I'm a senior in agriculture education here. And my question for you is about the role of education, specifically how implementation of that in the classrooms and in the field can help to perpetuate some of the values that you're talking about in making a positive impact for the future generations. So when we, when we think, I'm going to answer it two different ways. When we think about our people, and their development, certainly they have to come with a base level of education and education, ongoing education becomes important more from showing the, the desire to keep learning. But in our workforce, we would say 70% of, of the person's development is on the experiences they get. So equally, we would continue to work on um, what are the experiences we want this person to have to really round them out and better develop them. As we think about ag education, especially in developing parts of the world, but I would even argue here, uh, the number one opportunity to significantly increase yields in India, in China, in uh, uh, some of the areas of Brazil and other developing markets in, in Sub-Saharan Africa is agronomic education. And so when we work on these partnerships with these NGOs, one of the first things we do is, is create uh, small schools that are teaching agronomic de decision making. And that's the greatest opportunity there. Um, so from that standpoint, I would say it's, it's the education part. From our standpoint, inside the company, while you can always continue to learn, it, it, we are focused a lot on the experience set that you're, you're getting. Thank you. So the last word, fittingly enough, goes to the guy in the green shirt. <laughs> Uh, I'm Zach Reaver. I'm a first year master's student in the ecological sciences and engineering program here. Uh, so my question was, uh, with John Deere being, having such a global presence and a huge amount of resources at its disposal, 
uh, what role do you see John Deere playing in uh, addressing concerns of climate variability and uh, like nutrient loading of freshwater systems? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, and believe it or not, that, that's one even uh, our board challenges us with, uh, making sure are we really thinking about this in its entirety. Um, we've actually, we've been on some uh, uh, groups that you might not think we would be on. You know, we're in the, for example, as I mentioned, we're number one in forestry equipment around the world. Uh, but we were on the, uh, you know, don't cut down the rainforest commission and, and partnered on that. And in fact, I can say even back when I was running the construction forestry group, I, I know for a fact that then we actually, uh, our forestry dealers in Brazil knew that if they ever sold a piece of logging equipment to somebody that was going into the Amazon, that we would revoke their license and they would no longer be our dealer. So we do think there's an element of that that we need to be uh, a part of. Um, we do try to participate with other thought leaders on where is this going and as a result of this, how are we going to have to react or what are the possibilities. Um, the, uh, you know, it, it, and we're trying to do it from a standpoint of how, how do you mitigate climate change but do it in a fashion that incents the farmers rather than penalizing farmers, for example. Uh, so maybe it's incent uh, no-till practices, for example, um, so that you don't let gases come out of the soil. Um, those are the type of things we continue to work on. And then the other part, if you read our stock prospectus, it will say, you know, one of the risks that our company faces, and companies like ours, is climate change and what that might do to weather patterns as a result of that to cropping practices and or regions where you might be able to farm. So that's more just how do you mitigate that risk, but we also try to work on the policy side with these groups, albeit with a, with a, a reason, which is that we want to try to do it in a way that is is as much as possible favorable, or at least not too detrimental to our customers. Thank you, Zach. Well, let's see. Um, smart, well-educated, competent, uh, achiever of results, risk taker, and a global vision. And on top of all that, modest and self-effacing. If you didn't know where the man went to school, you could pretty much guess Purdue University, don't you think? Thank you, Sam Allen, Thank for you. being with us. Thank you very much. And here's just, just a little token of how grateful Purdue is and how proud we are of you. Thank you, and please come again soon. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you.